rundown. Well, even if you follow American Israeli diplomacy, one name you may not be so familiar with is Aryeh Lightstone. He's a rabbi, educator, and entrepreneur from New York who ran in some of the same circles as U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman and was chosen four years ago to be a senior advisor. Now, Lightstone is credited as serving as a key behind-the-scenes player in the making of the Abraham Accords and was designated a special envoy for economic normalization. Now, before his tenure in Jerusalem ends on Wednesday, our senior U.S. Correspondent, correspondent Mike Wagenheim chatted with him about his unlikely ride through Mideast history. Very happy to have on Rabbi Arya Lightstone, the special advisor to U.S. Ambassador David Friedman and one of the architects of the Abraham Accords. Uh, Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us here. It, it's been an amazing journey for you, I'm sure. You were uh, unknown outside of uh, certain circles Four years ago, uh, David Freeman selected you as a special advisor, still unknown outside of a lot of certain circles, but been an amazing part of history on the first direct flights to a number of Arab countries from Israel, a key component of the drafting of the Abraham Accords and the economic development that's gone along with it. Tell us about this, this journey over the last few years, and especially the last few months since, uh, since news of the Abraham Accords broke. First of all, it is really great to be with you. Uh, I admire your work, your channel, uh, and, and feel a special kinship with your audience. I wish I was an architect of the Abraham Accords. I'm not. Uh, there are architects and there are builders. Uh, I'm the builder. Uh, we have the privilege of, from the Secretary of State, to Jared Kushner and Todd Berkowitz, Ambassador Friedman, as the architects of the Accords. Uh, some of us, the NSC team at the White House and myself over here in this time zone, have a chance to take those designs and to implement them into things that have real lasting consequences. And uh, it's been an honor and privilege to be able to do that over the last six months specifically. Uh, but since Ambassador Friedman chose me to be his senior advisor, uh, this has been an experience of a lifetime for myself, my wife, and my kids, uh, representing the United States of America uh, with our closest ally in the region, the state of Israel. So it has been incredibly exciting. You know, Israeli-Arab normalization has been in the works for quite some time, some of it secretive, some of it an open secret, but everything seemed to really start coming together, at least on paper, in August. You said recently, since then, it's all about going big and going quick. How, how big and how quick did you imagine it would get to this point, not only with the United Arab Emirates, but since then, Bahrain joining on, Sudan joining on, Morocco outside the framework of the Abraham Accords, but still normalization deal and, and possibly more to come. Did you think this amount could get done in this little time? Yeah, definitely not possibly more to come. Definitely more to come. Uh, peace does not belong to Republicans or to Democrats. Uh, it is not an issue for Jews or Christians or Muslims. It's an issue for mankind. Uh, and I think we're uniquely positioned to be the feel-good story of 2020 going into 2021. And the proof is in the pudding. This is not a PR release. It's not about a quick tweet or a quick uh, photograph. Uh, this is about changing history. And 2020 is going to be remembered for two things. One is what happened to the world uh, with the coronavirus. And the second is what brave leaders did to the world to make the future not dependent on what the past was. And that has to do with the leadership of the United Arab Emirates, the Kingdom of Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, the State of Israel, and of course, the United States of America, without whom uh, none of these things would have been possible. So, uh, so this is an extremely exciting opportunity to be able to go big and do it quickly. And when you say go big, it means you can spend lots of time discussing various different MOUs, various different agreements, various different opportunities. We can policy plan this to death, or we can do stuff. And what we've decided immediately after the first phone call, let's get a first commercial flight, let's sign MOUs, let's have an investment protection agreement, let's see how quickly we can open up liaison offices where necessary and embassies where important, uh, and to be able to create all of these things that frankly would have happened in a non-COVID-19 world in a more natural fashion. But because you have this tremendous obstacle, but you have this tremendous opportunity, we, the United States of America, served as a bridge to help these countries overcome those obstacles to be able to seize upon the opportunity that's there. The way I like to describe it is that the relationship in between the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel was a tightly coiled spring just waiting to be released. And the economic, cultural, and other opportunities that are emanating from these relationships right now 
have caused that wellspring of excitement in Sudan, in Morocco, and elsewhere. Uh, truly, people are looking at this region not as a source of consternation and frustration, but as a source of hope and guidelines to the future. In your mind, and you may not be able to prognosticate, do you feel that the next administration can take the ball and, and roll with it on, on what's been built so far? And have you laid out a blueprint to do that? From talk to action, demonstrates more than anything else, go big and go quick. Because we live in a region where talk is pretty cheap. Action is not only noticed, but is deeply respected. And therefore, if you have a phone call in the Oval, but there's no first flight, if you have a phone call in the Oval and there's no signing, if you have a phone call in the Oval and there's just a press release, but there aren't businesses that are interacting with each other, tourism that's happening, exchanges from the universities, then it's just a phone call. And the phone call could be exciting for a day or two, but it's not going to change lives. The implementation of the Abraham Accords is changing lives in the here and now, and the immediacy of this is very relevant. I, I don't need to prognosticate about a future administration because I can prognosticate about the American people. The American people in the United States of America have always been for peace. They've always been for freedom. They've always been for prosperity. They've always been for security. The Abraham Accords stemming and starting with the United States of America standing without any daylight with our number one ally in the region, Israel, has caused and created the room for the Abraham Accords to progress and to progress rapidly. Any and every American will be supportive of this. Part of what was laid out um, by previous administrations was there can be no solution to the Israeli-Arab conflict and this, there is first a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Obviously, the Abraham Accords have turned that notion on its ear, and many Israelis would say they, they could have told you this a long time ago. However, the, the problem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict still exists. How in the current framework of the Abraham Accords of Israeli-Arab normalization that you've helped build can be used to solve either in the, the short term, long term, or anywhere in between, or try to minimize the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Yeah, it, the Abraham Accords have demonstrated that when leaders lead and they're willing to go ahead and grasp for a better future, that opportunities abound for all people in the region. I believe that that opportunity is there for the Palestinians. I'm optimistic that we're not terribly far away from them reaching for the opportunity. And they know that the United States of America and all the countries in and not yet in the Abraham Accords circle will be there to help them when they choose to join the circle of peace. That's fully up to them. The opportunity is there. Uh, the president, the secretary of state, and Jared Kushner and Avi Berkowitz and Ambassador Friedman, the architects of the Abraham Accords, have been exceptionally clear about this. There are rumors of one, maybe two last countries joining before January 20th. Any insight? One of the most remarkable parts of this administration is that Rather than talk about stuff, we try to do stuff. And uh, on August 13th, everyone was shocked by the phone call. There were three countries that kept radio silence uh, because we understand that in order to make substantial and significant changes, each country and each leadership needs to have room to be able to think, to be able to act, and to be able to react. And we believe that that is something that each of those countries needs to be able to have space to do. The Abraham Accords have set the framework for other countries to reach and to be part of this circle. I believe that there is no wrong time for peace. If it's tomorrow, we will embrace them as will the world. And if it's in 18 months from now, the United States of America will embrace them as will the world. Jared and Avi and the Secretary of State and Ambassador Friedman, uh, I think will be remembered in history for having changed this region from a source of frustration and consternation to future and hope. Rabbi Arya Lightstone, the Special Envoy for Economic Normalization, joining us here. Thanks so much for your time, for your insight, and uh, best of luck. And can't wait to see what comes next here uh, with the Abraham Accords and normalization. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Have a great night. Thank you.